Good morning. If you're visiting with us this morning, we are in the midst, we're a little more than halfway through, of reading through the Bible in a year. We're using a day-by-day kids' Bible, which is in chronological order, through the history timeline of God's people and how God has created things and God has blessed the nations through his people. And we're currently in the midst of reading the end of Ezekiel and the book of Daniel, and we just started Job as well the last couple of nights. Yes, Job is out of place chronologically, but it fits in because Ezekiel references Job. Job. And the stuff that the people of Israel are going through while they're in exile is very similar to what Job goes through. And it's a message, you can see this in the bulletin I wrote about it, it's a message of how they need to trust in God even in the midst of hard times because God is there. He is good. So God is good and all the time. Amen. So as we're in the midst of Daniel, there's this really interesting discussion that we need to have about Nebuchadnezzar, because let's talk about it from this direction. God is leading every single person he has created to a journey of freedom. The problem with this journey of freedom is that we live in the midst of sin, and we've been enslaved to sin in this bondage of sin, and we look at the world, and sometimes the sin looks good. And God is calling us away from that into freedom. And sometimes because the sin looks good, it doesn't always look like freedom. And sometimes we miss that. And sometimes the lack of freedom where we don't see what God's true freedom is for us, that God is leading us into, is because the sin is about us. It's about us getting everything right. It's about us getting the rules together. It's about that we've been made to look good and we've got to keep up looking good. It's that we've been put in positions of authority and we've got to make sure we maintain that authority because we've been put in that position. And the freedom that God wants to give you, this journey he wants to lead you through, is to free you to recognize that we should trust in him rather than trust in us. And us is a bad term on that one. Let's re-say that because this is so important. We must trust in him instead of I must be trusting in myself because I'm going to let myself down. No matter what position I'm put into, I'm never going to fulfill that position. No matter how good-looking I am, I'm never going to put on clothes good enough or eat well enough to be what God really wants me to be. And that's a journey of freedom that God is calling you into and calling you out of bondage of slavery to sin into a really good, goodness and newness of life that can only be done through Jesus Christ, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, who we need to follow and shake off the sins that hinder us, as the writer of Hebrews talks about. So we're going to talk about Nebuchadnezzar this morning. And we're going to talk about a lot of Nebuchadnezzar this morning. I want to do something with you guys this morning in the sermon that, I'll be honest, I've never heard done. I'm going to tell the whole entire story of Nebuchadnezzar as the book of Daniel goes through. And the reason for that is this. I am learning as I get to know God more and more, especially as I know the story of Jesus in my life more and more, that God is a storyteller of great proportions. That God loves story. He loves to live into the lives of other people and watch their stories and see how they bless his creation and to be a part of that and to shape their stories and be there and be a part of it. And not only, God does love, not only does God love our individual stories, he loves our group stories. And he loves to tell a large story in the midst of small stories. So we need to talk about this idea called meta narrative. What a meta narrative is, is the huge story That is over all the small stories. It's also known as a grand narrative or a grand story, an overarching story or storyline that gives context, meaning, and purpose to all of life. And here's why we're going to talk about it. In Daniel chapter 4, we begin with the meta narrative of Nebuchadnezzar's story. And we need to see how Nebuchadnezzar ends up getting here. In Daniel chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, Did you know that Nebuchadnezzar wrote almost a full chapter of the Bible? Most of the time when we think about Bible authors, we think about these these Jewish guys, um, these Christian guys, and um, that have been Holy Spirit inspired, that have given us the word of God. And uh, um, Nebuchadnezzar is an author. How in the world did he get into God's word? Because I don't know about you, but from the historical understanding that I, I have of Nebuchadnezzar, this is a bad dude. This is a guy that has hurt people. I mean, he often talks, and we're going to go through as we talk about a story about tearing people limb from limb. That's not the story of God. The story of God is building up a valley of dry bones and giving him life. 
The story of God is giving life and creating out of where there is brokenness. The story of evil is about destroying. But the story of God is giving life. And look what Nebuchadnezzar says as he begins to give his testimony. I, King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show you the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs! How mighty his wonders! His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. So what I want to do this morning in our sermon is walk through how God's meta-narrative meta impacts Nebuchadnezzar's life. That's fun to say all together. How God's meta-narrative impacts King Nebuchadnezzar's life. Because King Nebuchadnezzar is a really interesting story if you watch all that's in, about him in the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar's story begins with Daniel chapter 1. Nebuchadnezzar goes to Jerusalem multiple times. And when he goes to Jerusalem, he besieges Jerusalem. He makes war against Jerusalem. And he captures the people of Jerusalem and takes many of them back to Babylon. He also destroys God's temple. He takes the gold and the silver and the bronze from the temple. He destroys God's altar. He cracks open the um, brass sea where they would wash their hands, where baptisms would be done. He gets rid of all of that stuff and takes it for himself. Because Nebuchadnezzar, being the king of the world at the time, was about himself. He was about being king of the world at the time. And the people that he brought from Jerusalem, many of them were um, of the lineage of David. Can we say that? Meaning that they were royal bloodline. And a couple of them, like Daniel, show up in this story. And he gets the young men that he sees as being good, making his kingdom look good. And he wants to indoctrinate them with his own culture. He wants to feed them with his clothes so that way they look good and, or feed them with food and clothe them with their clothes so that way they look good and healthy and look like good Babylonians where he can sit back and say, hey, look at me. I'm the king of the world. I'm like a god. I can even make people that worship other gods look like my people, sound like my people, eat like my people, and have the wisdom of my people. So he shares with them about false gods like the dragon, like Bel and the dragon that, um, that shows up in the uh, Babylonian false god stories. And he shares all this stuff. And we find out in Daniel chapter 1 that King Nebuchadnezzar assigned the young men that he took, signed them a daily portion of food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. And they were to be educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Now, Daniel was a little bit different than everybody else that Nebuchadnezzar had taken from all the other nations because Daniel held fast to his culture. And it wasn't a culture necessarily that Daniel was holding fast to that, that really got him. It was his God that he was holding fast to. And the stuff that Nebuchadnezzar was offering to Daniel, God had told the Israelites, don't take part in this kind of stuff. I don't know why the wine wasn't okay, because the Israelites had wine and God had given it to them, but maybe that the, um, the vessels that they made the wine in weren't clean according to the Israelite purification laws. Maybe they had made wine in it before, and maybe there was possibility of bacteria and stuff growing in it that was making it, it would make them ill. Nebuchadnezzar's food was probably, his plates probably always had pork on them. Poor Israelites, they can't eat bacon. <laughs> Praise God that Jesus changed all that, right? because bacon cheeseburgers are wonderful. But Daniel looks at this, looks at the food, and says, we can't partake in this. I've not defiled myself this way. So he goes to the steward of Nebuchadnezzar and says, we can't eat this stuff. Can we eat what we want to eat, vegetables and water? And the steward says, I can't do this. If the king, king Nebuchadnezzar notices, he basically says, if he notices you're not fat like the rest of Nebuchadnezzar's people, that's in scripture. That your flesh isn't filled out like the rest of his people, He'll recognize something was wrong and I'll be in trouble. And Daniel says, just give us 10 days. Just 10 days. Let us eat vegetables, fruit, and drink water. And then we'll see what happens. Nebuchadnezzar's off doing his own thing as kings do. He's not worrying about the training of these guys because he expects his people in command to worship him and to do everything he asks them to do because he has command. He's king, by the way. But after 10 days... Daniel and his friends, it says, in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, this is after they go before the king, he found them ten 
times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And just before that, it says that they were even healthier than everybody else, that their bodies looked healthier and they did a whole lot better. See, the meta story of Nebuchadnezzar has already begun. God's already begun shaping him by showing him that his ways aren't always the right ways, that they aren't always the best ways. Yes, you were king and you're in your place, but just because you think something is right doesn't, make, doesn't mean it's always exactly right. So we continue on in the story of Nebuchadnezzar, and you end up in Daniel chapter 2. And oftentimes when we hear sermons about uh, Daniel, we go chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, in separate settings. It takes like a, uh, like a month to be able to talk about this. But wait till you hear God's meta story, his meta narrative that he shares with Nebuchadnezzar, and how Nebuchadnezzar is able to say what he says in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, that I believe in God and that he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. In Daniel chapter 2, we begin finding out that Nebuchadnezzar is having a dream, and the dream is messed up. If you had a dream like this, this would be one of those nights where you were having a hard time sleeping. You would wake up and go, yeah, I don't know about this one. What Nebuchadnezzar sees in his dream, he wants other people, his magicians, his wisdom givers of the area, to tell him what his dream means. And he wants them not only to interpret the dream, but to tell him the dream. And all the guys speak up and say, Nebuchadnezzar, we can't do this for you. You need to tell us what the dream is in order for us to interpret. We have no idea what you dreamed about. And Nebuchadnezzar believes that there's going to be somebody that can tell him what the dream is. He believes it so much, he says to all of them, if none of you wise you wisdom givers do this, I'm going to tear you limb from limb. Every single one of you and burn down your houses. What a king, huh? He's willing to destroy all the wisdom of his kingdom. What do you think he thinks about himself that he's willing to do that? Do you think he relies on the wisdom of these guys? That he trusts in it? That he believes that he needs them? Seems to me like he's pretty alone. But Daniel, about the time that they're starting to arrest everybody and take them to start destroying them, Daniel says, hold up, hold up. I think we can do something about this. I think I can do something about this because my God is God. And here's what he says explicitly. Then Daniel went to the house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, which you know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his companions. And he told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning the mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven, and Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things, and he knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, and for you have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to me the king's matter. So Daniel ends up going after praying that amazing prayer to God, where he's basically saying, God, you are God. You are the true king, and you're the only one who really gives freedom. You can interpret that out of what he says. He says, you empower people to be what they should be. You give wisdom. You put kings in their places, and you remove them. He goes to Nebuchadnezzar and says, all right, Nebuchadnezzar, here's what the dream is. Here's what you dreamed. You dreamed of a huge statue. The head was of gold. The arms and chest were of silver. The belly and thighs were of bronze. The legs were iron, and the feet were iron and clay mixed. While you were looking at the statue, a rock was cut out of the side of a mountain and was hurled at the statue, and it hit the statue in the feet. And when the rock hit the feet of the statue, the statue was obliterated. It fell apart. It separated. It was done for. That rock ended up becoming planted and grew into a mountain. And he says, Nebuchadnezzar, here's what the dream means. You, O king, who he had just got done saying... God puts people in their places and takes them out of it. You, O king, are the head of gold. The belly or the arms and chest of silver are a kingdom that are going to come after you. And the belly and thighs is another kingdom that's going to come after. And the legs of iron and the iron feet clay mix are a kingdom that are going to come after that. And he says, you, O king, are that head of gold. But there is another kingdom that's going to come and destroy all those kingdoms. It'll be like a small rock cut out of a mountain, but it'll end up growing into a mountain and it'll be the kingdom of God. 
Nebuchadnezzar at the end of Daniel chapter 2, after he hears this, and hears, first he hears the dream exactly as he sees it, without Daniel being told what it is. Nebuchadnezzar says to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. As we look at the meta narrative of Nebuchadnezzar, I want you to notice one thing here as he talks about God and gives him praise. Does he connect with God? Does he allow God to free him from the bondage of slavery of sin that Nebuchadnezzar has been in the midst in? Does he say that I'm willing to serve and trust and obey in this God? No. He says, Daniel, your God revealed. Your God. And he's staying aloof and staying away. In Daniel chapter 3, we get into the story, and it continues really interestingly. And I bet you time took place in between the dream and Daniel chapter 3 because he hears about the dream and hears that the statue's going to be destroyed. And then you get to Daniel chapter 3, and all of a sudden, Nebuchadnezzar builds the statue that he sees. And my theory is this, that Nebuchadnezzar builds a statue of himself, 90 feet tall and 10 feet wide, which means that it's not an exactly 90 foot tall person. It's a person on top of a pedestal. Because if it was 90 feet tall and 10 feet wide, or 9 feet wide, it'd be a really skinny person. It wouldn't go back to Daniel chapter 1 where they're eating the king's food so that way they may be fat like the rest of the Babylonians. You don't have that. And so he builds up the statue of himself, and guess what it's made of? You, O king, are the head of gold. He builds a statue to worship himself. He is still enslaved with self-worship and still not willing to live in the freedom that God has shown and proven to him from Daniel and his friends eating well and having wisdom, from Daniel being able to reveal mysteries because he's trusting in God. He's still not getting it. He's still not living into the meta-narrative that God would want him to have. The whole reason the Israelites are there to begin with, as Habakkuk shows us really clearly, is that God led them there. That God gave Babylon the ability to be able to take them to exile. That God is in control and that God is the true king. So he builds up this statue and he tells everybody, all right, when all the musical instruments play, everybody's got to stop what they're doing, bow down and worship this image. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have a hard time with this because they're not going to worship a false god. They are free even when they're in the midst of exile. Because they trust God and God has led them to be free. Some of the other Chaldeans around the area, probably some of the wise men that have been made look foolish over and over again by these four guys, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, go to Nebuchadnezzar and say, hey, have you noticed these guys aren't bowing down and praying and worshiping when the music plays? These guys haven't been living into the story that you want them to live into. They haven't been enslaved to your kingship. They believe they're free to worship how they want to worship. In verse number 13 of Daniel chapter 3, it says this. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage. If you think kings are free because they have all this power and might and they can command people what they, to do what they want to do, if you think that that means that that's what true freedom is, you should think otherwise as you notice some of the behaviors, emotions that they emit. Because I don't know about you, but when I think about people that are free and that are not enslaved, I don't think of terms like furious rage. I don't. Furious rage doesn't sound fun. It's not fun to get your blood pressure up and boiling. It's not fun to be angry at something. It's not, you want everything to go your way. And if things go your way, you don't get into furious rage, right? I see a man enslaved to himself. I see a man who worships himself so much he's willing to build a statue to himself and that when people don't bow down and worship that statue, that it affects him because he's enslaved to that sin of self-worship. So he goes to them and says, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you did not serve the gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the lyre, the pipe, the organ, all that other stuff, I like the bagpipe is in here. I like bagpipes. They're fun. When you hear that, fall down and worship. Otherwise, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? And I love this. This is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who look like they're slaves, but they actually aren't, 
answer and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. Can we reinterpret that as able to free us? From the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Very next verse. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury. He's still enslaved to himself. He's not free. He is a broken man who's full of power and corruption, who thinks himself is everything, and he's not free to live how God really created him, to be a king that lives and blesses the nations. Full of fury commands that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I love this, were bound, tied up together, In verses 23 and 25, we read this. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. This is after Nebuchadnezzar's guys bound him together. They get the fire heated up seven times hotter than it's been heated. They throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in. And because the fire is so hot, the guards, the really strong guys that should be able to endure, die from the heat. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego look like slaves thrown in a furnace. They are bound Every time we talk about the story, we kind of miss this part because we're like, oh, they're thrown in the fiery furnace. And look, he answered, um, this is Nebuchadnezzar, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt and the form of the fourth is like the son of the gods. And they come out and when they come out, they notice that there's not even a smell of smoke on their clothes. There's no singeing on their clothes. Their hair is completely all right. Everything is fine. And we completely overlook this fact. They were tied together with a rope. And the only thing the furnace ate was their enslavement. The rope was destroyed. And when they're in the fiery furnace, I believe with all my heart, Jesus joins them there. Jesus is in the midst of the furnace and in the midst of the freedom that they have. And they are free men. They're walking around as free men in the midst of the fire and flames. Nebuchadnezzar can't do anything in the midst of his fury. And Nebuchadnezzar realizes something, and I love how chapter 3 ends. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember chapter 2? Daniel, praise your God, who is the Lord of Lords. Praise be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, now Nebuchadnezzar's taken one more step in his meta narrative. I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. Nebuchadnezzar's eyes are opened up by seeing the freedom that's given in the fiery furnace in a place that looks like enslavement and death. And he, his eyes are open and he realizes something. These guys might be on to something. <laughs> They're doing whatever they want. They're in the midst of my kingship and they're exiled and yet they can walk in the midst of fire and they're free. They don't have to bow down when all the instruments are playing. They're free. You know what? Maybe there's something about this. And so he continues on in Daniel chapter 4, and Nebuchadnezzar is given another dream by God. Time goes by, and Nebuchadnezzar receives this dream, and what he sees is a tree grows and becomes incredibly strong. And its top reached to the heavens, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heavens lived in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. He continues on to the dream, and a watcher from heaven, a holy one, comes and decrees that the tree should be cut down. And the tree is cut down and left as just the stump and roots. And bronze, if I remember right, bronze is coated over the whole entire tree to keep it from growing and to enslave it. And the animals disperse. Everything is taken away. And in the dream, the dew from heaven comes down on this this stump. And it looks as if it's dead. But after seven years, if I remember right, after seven years, the tree is able to have life again. Daniel is involved again because he's trusting in God. He's free. He comes to Nebuchadnezzar and says, I can interpret that dream for you. 
And after he interprets the dream, he says this. Therefore, oh, let me tell you what the interpretation is real quick if you haven't read it this week. The interpretation is that you, Nebuchadnezzar, are that tree. You have been ruling over everything, and you're really a slave. You're going to be chopped down, you're going to be covered with bronze, and you're going to crawl in the wilderness naked on your hands like an animal for seven years, and the dew will fall on your back, and your hair will grow and become like feathers on your back. But then after that, you'll be able to come back after you declare that God is truly God and be free from the enslavement of yourself. And Daniel says this. He says, this, Daniel loves Nebuchadnezzar. He wants what's good for him because Daniel is free. He doesn't, he's not entrapped by the enslavement of sin and brokenness that's around him. He says to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4, verse 27, Therefore, O king, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right. Be free from your brokenness. Be free from your sins and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. Daniel's words are this. Continue being the servant that God has made you to be. Be a tree that feeds all the animals and feeds the earth. Be free. The only thing you have to do is trust in the God that gave you this power. That it's not your power. Repent. Quit sinning. At the end of all this, after everything, because it ends up happening to him a year later, he ends up going crazy and living in the wilderness. And uh, finally, at the end of that, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures for generations to generations. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can say, or none can stay his hand and say to him, what have you done? Nebuchadnezzar's whole story, as we look at it, is a story of a guy that's trying to enslave people and make everybody like him. Not just like him, like being like him and dressing like him, but like him. Look to him and say, oh, you are awesome, Nebuchadnezzar. You look, we want to be just like you. We look up to you. He wants to be a king so bad and live into the position that he was given so bad that he's been worshiping himself and building idols for himself. And God, over time, shows him that he's not free. Shows him that it's the people that trust in God and that are willing to give mercy and be who God has made them to be, even if it ends them getting thrown into a fiery furnace, that they are the truly free ones and that they are the ones to be in God's creation and taken care of and to be right. This is important for us today, not because there's Nebuchadnezzar's in the world today. Not because there's these great kings that are going to throw us in fiery furnaces. I mean, what would NATO do if like, somebody started doing something like that? They would be attacking right away, right, if there was a king? But because we are Nebuchadnezzar. This story is important because the meta narrative that is shown, this overall story that is shown through Nebuchadnezzar, is a story that is about you and I. It's a story about how we have been enslaved to sin and how it has blinded us from true freedom, that the journey of true freedom that God wants to call you into, that God wants to call you out of. It's a story that says that no matter how many rules you try to set up so that way your kingdom looks great while it's around you, you can't actually create freedom by your rules. It's only the rules that God gives that creates freedom. It's that God loves and that God is sep- setting you apart. We, o- we often have a hard time reading that last verse because it almost sounds like Nebuchadnezzar is saying, you are a God who enslaves. But the real truth of it, as you look at the meta narrative of, of, of Nebuchadnezzar, is that he is saying, you are a God who puts people in their places that they may be free. That they may live into the rules of your creation in a way that is good and blessed for them as well as the people that are around them. There was a group of guys during the time of Jesus that had the same problem as Nebuchadnezzar. We call them Pharisees, teachers of the law, scribes, chief priests. In John chapter 8, the chapter begins with a woman who's caught in the midst of adultery, and a bunch of guys are around her saying, all right, Jesus, we know what the rules are. What are you going to do about it? We know that we're all enslaved to these rules, and these rules are about ourselves and us looking better than this woman who was caught in the midst of a sin. And Jesus breaks the rules and brings true freedom into it. Because what he says to these men are, you who are without sin, go ahead and cast the first stone. And the older gentlemen that are in the crowd are wise, and they recognize that. 
They're enslaved to sin, and they walk away. And finally, the younger guys walk away, and the woman looks up at Jesus and says, Jesus says to her, where are your condemners? Where are your rule makers that are going to abide? Where are the kings that are trying to enslave you? Because they're really enslaved themselves. And she says, they've left, my Lord. And he says, neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. These guys come back later on to try to, get, try to ensnare Jesus, try to enslave him back to the rules of what it means to be little kings like they're trying to be. And they ask him, hey, where's your testimony from? Who's the witness that says that you really are the son of God? And Jesus gives them testimony. He says, Moses has spoken to me about me. God has spoken to me. My own witness counts because I'm the son of God. And then he says this to them. So Jesus said to the Jews... Who had, believed in, or who had believed in him. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. That's interesting. Because the story of Abraham is Egypt, Exodus, Israel going to Assyria, Judah going to Babylon, the Roman Empire, or actually the Greek Empire first, which is the chest and arms of silver, the Roman Empire, which is the legs, I'm sorry, the Persians got them first, it's the chest and arms of silver, then the belly and thighs of bronze is the Greek Empire's enslaved them, and then the legs of iron is the Roman Empire enslaved them. They've been enslaved forever. We are the children of Abraham, and we've not been enslaved by anybody. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Brothers and sisters, there's a kingdom that's trying to enslave you, and it's the kingdom of sin. And the problem with the kingdom of sin is it's really hard to see that enslavement that's coming because enslavement is almost always exactly like Nebuchadnezzar's enslavement. We're enslaving ourselves. Because our pride is causing us to lift ourselves up. Our, our rule standards that we're trying to set around us are trying to set up our kingdoms to make sure everything looks good and nice while it's around us and everything works and flows well. Now, our cars never break down. Our bodies never get sick because we've been eating the right things and keto diet's making us thinner instead of fat like Nebuchadnezzar. And everything's going really well. That was kind of funny. You can giggle at that. And so everything's going well. We, we set up this pride kingdom around us and we try to push God out of it. And God the whole time has been saying, I want to free you. I want you to live in my kingdom, not as slaves, but as my children. I want you to live a life that's full and meaningful, that you may be a blessing to the nations that are around you, and that people may know that there truly is a God that loves them, that created them, and knows them, and frees them. Nebuchadnezzar at the end says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. For all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. That's what Jesus came for. He came to humble us so that we, we may be lifted up and be able to walk in newness of life. He came to humble us to remove these pride kingdoms that are around us, that are making us look like little Nebuchadnezzars. I don't know how you'd say the feminine form of that, Nebuchadnezzar us or something, but making us look like him where our meta narrative is all about ourselves because the real truth, the real meta narrative that's going on in this world is that God sent his one and only son because he loves us so much to free us from the kingdoms of ourselves. That when we get thrown into fiery furnaces, the only thing that burns away is the bonds that hold us because God wants to free you that you may live and that you may live well and live into this journey, this freedom that God has called you into. So my question for you, brothers and sisters, is this. What freedom is God calling you into? What pride is he trying to remove from your life that he did through Jesus Christ, who died for your sins so you don't have to live in him any longer? How may the nations and the people around you may be blessed because you are no longer worried about your own pride and these little rule kingdoms that are around us that we may be a blessing to others and share the good news that Jesus is the Son of God and that those who believe in him are free indeed. If you need to follow Jesus in baptism, the way is easy. Come and talk to me about it or talk to one of our shepherds about being baptized because following Jesus is the only way that you will truly be free. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. 
And if you need prayer for anything, especially pride in your life, have enough humility to be able to remove that pride and come before God and let us be a part of being your brother or sister and praying for you. Because I can say this in front of all of you. I have my own pride kingdoms that I need freedom from, that I need to trust in God that sometimes fiery furnaces are okay because I need those bonds, those ropes that are enslaving me to be gone. Because I need to trust in him. I'm not going to be saved by anything that I can do. I'm only saved by the Savior, by the Son who came and gave his life that I might be free from the pride of myself.